with our words, and we bear witness as well in our Christian practice. And we believe that there is to be consistency as best as we are able in word and practice. Just another way of saying, say what you do and do what you say. We are, nevertheless, often inconsistent in matching up our words with our practices. We don't do it intentionally. It's part and parcel with being in bondage to sin, as the old liturgy tells us, and unable to free ourselves. But the detail of that bondage is sometimes found in what we can best describe as sometimes our overconfidence in what we believe God wants from us. Sometimes, especially when the words of scripture and liturgy become so routine that we forget to give it a whole lot of thought, we forget the essential message, or we run through it all so quickly that we miss some really vital things about it. Most of all, when we do that, we miss the gift of life itself that is expressed and put into action in those words and in those practices. When we think we know it all, when we think we have the faithful practice of faith under our belts and it is put into practice one way and only one way, when we do either or both of those, that's when we fall short. It's a far too rigid approach to obedience. It does not take into account new ways of seeing, new ways of understanding, broader and more expansive ways of practicing our faith in Christ. When I teach Bible study, I often counsel people to slow down their reading. This is particularly difficult when we read portions of scripture that are so completely familiar to us. They feel like a comfortable, warm blanket. Just for fun, now, when I talk about fun, I'm talking about nerdy pastor kind of fun, okay? So take that with a grain of salt, okay? But just for fun, sit down within the next two or three days and read Luke chapter two to yourself. Or I would even suggest that you read it aloud to yourself. Luke's version of the birth of Jesus. And I want you to read it slowly. And I do mean slowly, snail's pace. And while you do that reading aloud, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Why does Luke say it that way? Why is this word or this sentence important to the story? And what is God saying to us through these passages today, just for today? How is God's word? And how has God's counsel spoken to us anew in fresh and enlivening ways? Because you see, the word lives. It is not frozen in one time and place. It isn't interpreted one way and one way only for all generations. We hear a living word and then we practice what God is saying to us in what we hear. What we practice is meant then to be a reflection of God's gift of daily renewal of life. And so what we hear may well be a new thing from which will spring forth a new action and certainly a new creation. When God created the world, God did not assemble every piece to set the thing in motion and then just step back away from it and let it run on its own. 
God is not nearly that detached, nor does he intend to be that way. No, God keeps creating. And what God creates, God continues to revisit and reshape and redeem. God continues to be involved with us. When earth was fashioned, once the work was complete, what did God do? God rested. Like everything else in the creation, God also saw the necessity and goodness of Sabbath rest. But why would God sanction a Sabbath and a rest? Was God tired? Or is the Sabbath for something more than a rigid adherence to doing nothing? No work just because God said so. Take this under consideration. Those of you who are artistic in any number of ways, uh, where are the, the prayers and stitches people or all of you folks out there or the quilters all of and, and, and other things that you do that are of a creative nature, if you are doing that, when you have finished your work, what do you do? My guess is that you step back from the work and you savor the moment of completion. You enjoy what you have made. The work of your hands, the work of your mind and your vision have led to something that gives you life. And more so, when what you have made can be given so that someone else can have life and enjoy it. The rest that comes after labor is joyful and not at all a stiff and unbending mandate. Now, all of that is prologue to Luke's story today. It is the Sabbath. And that's where we meet Jesus, and the law states that there is no work to be done. None. Zilch. Zero. Jesus notices at the synagogue a woman bent over and unable to stand up. In one sense, the word informing the practice, you know, that consistency between word and practice I just mentioned, the word informing the practice would have Jesus wait until sundown and the end of the Sabbath. That would be the right thing to do, right? But in another sense, this woman's life continues to be put on hold because of a narrow, restrictive understanding of what the gift of God's Sabbath really is. So why is now the wrong time? Why not give life now? Does God really intend to keep our hands tied so that a life cannot be restored until it's time? Or does God, at least a God who is involved with the creation, does that same God will that this woman be healed in the moment? Now, let's be honest. You and I, we love it when Jesus gets in the faces of the religious leaders of his day because we revel in what always seems to be Jesus' rebellious, iconoclastic actions, and we go, yay, Jesus. But in this instance, Jesus is not a breaker of the law. Rather, Jesus looks at the Sabbath law in a much larger way and is, in fact, observant of it as something that is intended to give life rather than to shrink it, to restrict it. The synagogue leader looks at the whole thing one way and one way only, and that is this. Couldn't Jesus have waited, or worse yet, couldn't this woman have waited until the sun went down and the Sabbath was over to seek healing 
and redemption. But I think the better question is this. Why make her wait? 18 years she's been this way. Hasn't she suffered enough? Is God really a God who points to his watch and says, uh 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 uh, not yet? Jesus pokes holes in this very narrow and limited thinking by saying, Look, if your livestock need water on the Sabbath, don't you work to make sure that your animals get the water that they need? You treat your poverty better than you treat each other. This daughter of Abraham, in bondage for 18 years, is meant to live fully and freely in God's Sabbath rest and enjoyment. And that life begins now. Sabbath is God's gift to us. One which causes us to rejoice, to give thanks, and to enjoy this life. You know, there's that paraphrase, or there is a paraphrase, of the words of Henry David Thoreau when he says, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to suck all the marrow of life, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. We sanctify life by living it. By aligning our words, which speak of the value of life, aligning them with actions and intentions which hold up those values. The risk of dishonoring Sabbath is not by unbinding it from the law, rather it is in binding it too restrictively to it so that no one lives in this joyful moment. And no one lives in the hope of God's will to bathe us in the light of redemption and recreation. I wonder, maybe you do too, likely you do, I wonder about this and a variety of other things, that in this country we talk a great deal about the sanctity of life, but the rationale for our conversations is inconsistent. And look, folks, we're all guilty of this. No one is absolved in this ongoing conversation. We all have dirty hands. Our words and our practices rarely match up. It's true. Perhaps if we begin every conversation in our public discourse by slowing down enough to listen, by taking into consideration the difference between what is life affirming and what is life denying, and finally to pray with the understanding that the holiness of life is also the enjoyment of life as God gives it, and that we always, always live in the sure and certain hope that what God has made us to be is worthy of enjoyment and redemption and daily renewal. And if we do that, if we take those small, simple steps, then maybe we might find more common ground than we may have first thought. We are, after all, one body in Christ. As one body, we practice our words, and our words become praxis. That is what it means to be in mission as Christ's resurrection people. Unless we forget, our words and our practice are summed up succinctly in the welcome we offer to the newly baptized at the conclusion of the baptismal rite. We say, we welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. 
join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Amen. Thank you.